And today God has spoken to me, and I want to show you some things that will clarify for you what God is doing in here, in this church. This is not the church down the street. This is not the church across the country. This is Kingdom Gate, Pentecostal Church. You got fair warning before you ever got in the door. We're Pentecostal around here. We believe in the Holy Ghost just like they got it on the day of Pentecost. Hallelujah. And he's real. He's real in this service today. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Title of my message today is A Sure Foundation. I'm going to start in Isaiah, the 28th chapter, read a few verses in Isaiah before we move on. This is a familiar passage that we have visited from time to time over the last few years. And here's what Isaiah prophesied 700 years before the day of Pentecost. Here's what he said. For precept must, everybody say must. must. It's not optional, but it must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. Look at the next verse here. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To what people? To the ones who are receiving precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. I came to tell you, Kingdom Gate, that God is speaking in this last day in a way that He never has been speaking before in all of history. I believe that God is speaking to those in the end time church And the book of Revelation is very clear. Jesus says over and over again, seven different letters, and he says it seven different times. Let him that hath an ear hear what the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, is speaking to the church. Where do you think you're supposed to hear the voice of God? You're supposed to hear it from the Holy Ghost, who is the Spirit of truth. Hear a little, there a little. Precept upon precept, line upon line. For with stammering lips and another tongue, he's going to speak to this people to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing yet they would not hear. Now, it is a big temptation for me always to just go ahead and preach on the Holy Ghost and nothing else because I am an evangelist at heart and God has placed a mantle upon me and I have seen many people from many different backgrounds come and be baptized in the Holy Ghost both in this church and around the country and as a matter of fact even in the upper room in Jerusalem God allowed me to visit a number of years ago and I got the privilege of reading the second chapter of the book of Acts right there in the upper room on a tour group and I want to tell you what happened the Holy Ghost that had moved there 2,000 years ago and filled all those that were there he began to move again and he began to baptize right in that place and there were eight people filled with the Holy Ghost right there because I was reading the word of God in the upper room in Jerusalem one of them an 80 year old woman in the church that had never received the Holy Ghost went down speaking in tongues I'm just telling you it's real just in case you were wondering And it is available. See, I could just preach the Holy Ghost all day long, every day. (laughs) But you see, what we have to understand is that there is a reason that God has given us the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He is the spirit of truth. He will bring truth that the world cannot receive, that the world will never have access to. I want to tell you, God is revealing truth in this time, in this church. God is bringing to pass his word in the book of Revelation. He is speaking. The spirit of God is speaking. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I want to be somebody that is listening. I want to be somebody that is knocking. I want to be somebody that is seeking. I want to be somebody that doesn't miss what he's speaking. 
Hallelujah. Let's go to verse 16 in this same chapter, Isaiah 28 and 16 says, Therefore, therefore means because of all this that we've talked about, because it's going to be those with stammering lips and an unknown tongue that are receiving the revelations of the word of God through the power of the Holy Ghost, the spirit of truth, because of all of that. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Now, there's a lot in this verse, and I'm just going to unpack a little bit of it before we move on. First of all, I want you to understand that God is not speaking outside the church. He's speaking inside the church. He is building a church upon a rock. He said, upon this rock, not just any rock, but upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want to say that Jesus has a church, and his church is built upon the rock of revelation. His church is built upon a particular particular foundation and according to Isaiah it is a sure foundation somebody say that with me sure foundation this is a prophecy 700 years before Jesus would walk the earth and I want to just show you here what prophecy says about the foundation he says he that believeth shall not make haste so don't just what that means is don't read past this you need to pay attention to this Earlier up in the verse, it says that the foundation is going to be a stone that's tried, a precious cornerstone. Also prophesied in Psalm 118, we see that there will be a cornerstone that the builders rejected, which will become the head of the corner. In Matthew 21, in Mark 12, in Luke 12. 20, in Acts the fourth chapter and in 1 Peter 2 and 7 we see repeated from these prophecies that there is only one who fits the characteristics that were prophesied and we see that Jesus who was being prophesied in Isaiah and Psalm is the foundation that Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected but I've got good news for you today the stone that the builders tried to throw away the stone that the builders tried to kill and stamp out he has risen from the dead. He has received victory over death, hell, and the grave. And he has the keys of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven in his hand today. And he is triumphant. And he is the head of the corner. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. I'm glad I know him. Oh, I'm glad that it's not just theoretical for me. I'm glad today that he is real in my life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So he is the head of the corner. He is a sure foundation. Now, I want to take you to 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, and we're going to read a few verses here. The third uh, verse, uh, third chapter, rather, in the ninth verse says this, For we are laborers together with God. And ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto us as a wise master builder, Paul says, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon, but, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Look, there's only one foundation and his name is Jesus Christ, but you had better be careful what you place on top of that sure foundation. Let's look at the next verse here. Verse 11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, if there was any doubt, which is Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. He is the sure cornerstone. He is the first. And He is the last. Come on, somebody. He is the Alpha. And He is the Omega. I came to tell somebody, in Him we live and move and have our being. Oh, Oh, I breathe in him. I live in him. My heart beats in him. He is everything to me. And by him all things consist. 
I'm grateful to know that information because, you know, when the enemy comes around trying to discourage me with a little bit of health uh, issues and a little bit of th different things that I don't know what to do about, uh, you know what I can do? I can stand upon the foundation of the Word of God because He is the Word incarnate. John said this in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. The wo Word was God. And you know what happened? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory I came to tell you that Jesus Christ is the word and he said heaven and earth are going to pass away oh but my word will never pass away you can take it to the bank his word is going to stand sure forever it is a sure foundation. I want to tell you what the enemy is trying to do in this day, in this hour. He's not trying to make a bunch of atheists. No, he's simply trying to get you off the foundation. He's simply trying to move you over just a little bit. And, and maybe, maybe God didn't really mean all that that he said in his word. And maybe, maybe we can be word adjacent. Maybe we can just step over here. This looks pretty good. The grass seems a little greener over on this side. This might grow my church. This might make me a popular minister. This might cause people to, to like my videos that are on YouTube. This might do something for my reputation. Oh, I want I want to tell you, you had better build upon the rock that Jesus built the church upon. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for a sure foundation. It's going to take you all the way through. I said it's going to take you all the way through. All the way through to eternity. Hallelujah. There's something better waiting for you. And Jesus has made provision for you to make it all the way. I want somebody to receive that right now. The enemy has tried to scare some of you. The enemy has tried to say, well, it doesn't matter what the word says to you. But I've come to declare that God has a plan for your life. I've come to declare that he didn't forget about you. I came to declare circumstances have not changed God's plan. I came to tell you that he that hath begun a good work in you. Jesus Christ is going to perform it until the day of the Lord. He's still working his plan. Don't you dare forget how you got where you are. Don't you dare forget how you came into a place of victory, out of defeat, how you got out of the miry clay, out of the pit. Don't you ever forget what God has done for you. Ah. Woo! Hallelujah. He's a sure foundation. I, I don't care if you can't understand. He is the counselor. I don't care if your body is racked in pain. He's the healer of all of your diseases. I don't care what's going on. He's God Almighty. He is the everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. He's everything. He's everything you need. Oh, he's a sure foundation. He's a sure foundation. Hallelujah. I'm glad I found out. I'm so glad I know him today. Hallelujah. I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than anything that this world can give to me than houses. You can hand me a house and say, you can have this mansion. Come on, somebody. This could really happen to somebody. Matter of fact, there have been people in this church that have been tempted because somebody said, if you'll move away from where you are right now, I'll buy you a house. That has happened in this church. But you know what? They're still here. <laughs> They're still here because they can't afford to move away from the sure foundation of what God is doing in their lives. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Last time that I preached, I took a lot of my text from the book of Amos and preached out of three or four different chapters in Amos, and that was uh, a message that you might want to go back to. It is uh, entitled, uh, 
if I can get the right one, a love for the truth. And uh, in that message, in Amos, I, I won't go there right now, and I won't repeat those scriptures that I preached on last time, but in Amos, the eighth chapter in verses 11 and 12, it talks about a famine that will be coming in the last days. How many know that in Matthew, the 24th chapter, that Jesus begins to talk about some signs in direct answer to what the, the apostles had asked? What had they asked? Lord, what are the signs of the end? What are going to be the things that we watch for? How many know that the Word of God says, Jesus tells us in the book of Luke, of Luke that we've got to watch and pray, that we... Be, will be accounted worthy to escape all of the things uh, that are coming upon this earth. Uh, I want to tell somebody today uh, that God has a plan uh, for you to escape every bit of the judgment, every bit of what is coming upon this earth. We are not appointed under wrath, but God has made a plan for those that love Him that are called according to His purpose that are standing uh, upon the sure foundation uh, whose cornerstone is named Jesus. Uh, come on. Uh, you can't have it any other way except it comes through through Jesus. Here's what he said to make it real plain. He said I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. And then he even made it clearer. He said no man can come to the Father except they come through me. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's only through the precious sacrifice that he made for your salvation. You can't get there any other way. So when Paul said other foundation can no man lay than what I've laid out before you and that foundation is Jesus Christ. If there's any question about it, if somebody tries to tell you, well, all roads are going to lead to the same place. If somebody tries to tell you, oh, that's a religion of peace and we ought to respect it and those folks are just fine. No, if they don't know Jesus, they don't know anything. If they don't know Jesus, they're not saved. If they don't know Jesus, they're not going to make it. We've got to preach him. And just like Paul said, I determined not to know anything else except Jesus Christ. And I'm going to preach Jesus. I'm going to preach the cross. I'm going to preach the blood. I'm going to preach the Spirit of God. And I'm going to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is the foundation. He is the foundation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he'll never let you down. <laughs> He's the sure foundation. Um, this is a theme that we will be hearing in this month of summer recharge. Foundations of our faith. God has been uh, allowing us to build upon the sure foundation. And build a little bit here and a little bit there. And receive a, a, a line here. A precept there. And you're going to be hearing some of that throughout this month. But what God has spoken to me to deliver to you today is quite startling because it's, it's, I'm not going to get into detailed micromanaging of every service. Matter of fact, it's just the, the men and women of God who will be ministering are simply fitting within the theme of foundations of our faith. And, and I am not studying with them or dictating anything that is going to be preached but we're going to hear what the Holy Ghost has to say and you're going to find everything is going to fit together God has a plan don't you miss it God has a plan for this church God has a plan for the net God has a plan for the fish that he said you cast that net on the right side of the boat and I'm going to give you fish and you're going to have more fish than you know what to do with he said, I'll make you fishers of men. Hallelujah. And we're going to see what God does through this foundations of faith theme. But what I want to bring to your attention is, is more prophecy that God has brought before me because it is unmistakable. Now, we're going to go to Zechariah, which is one of the minor prophets, just like Amos. But in Zechariah, the 11th chapter, we're going to read a few verses, starting at verse 3. Here's what the prophet says. See if this sounds familiar to you. There is a voice of the howling of the shepherds, for their glory is spoiled. A voice of the roaring of young lions... For the pride of Jordan is spoiled. Now, I don't have time to spend 
on this particular uh, point because I preached a message on young lions. As a matter of fact, the title of that message is The Young Lions, and that was early last year in February of 22. So if you want to go back to that, I preached a detailed message. But let me just recap this. You see, that word in the Hebrew, young lions, is different from any other word in all of the Old Testament or the New Testament for that matter. And when you see the term young lions, it means something. It refers to something. Something. You might remember that in Psalm 91, the word of God came to David and said, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And when you go down, it says that the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear Him. And so it's about having fear. If you want to be in the right place with God, you've got to have some fear of God. And what is happening today is that men and women are making decisions about the own, their own self-righteousness, not righteousness that is in the Word of God, not righteousness that is holy and godly. They're trying to determine, this is what I'm going to call righteousness, and then I'm going to just make that the standard, and nobody else is going to be like me. Look at me. I'm amazing. That's called self-righteousness. And you know what Isaiah said? He said, your self-righteousness is filthy rags. It doesn't mean anything to God. God is not impressed with your self-righteousness. But here's what Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 33. He said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. By the way, I can't help but stop right here and tell you that that word, the kingdom of God, is the Greek word basilea. And do you know what it means? It means a foundation of power. A foundation of power power and that's what Jesus said that we need to seek first is the kingdom of God the foundation of power Jesus said in Acts 1 and 8 that you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you so simple logic dictates that you ought to be seeking the Holy Ghost if you don't have it is that right hallelujah but here's what I want to bring to your attention today. These young lions, it is the Hebrew word kafir. And it very specifically speaks of pastors who are corrupted in the last days, as well as false prophets that rise up in the last days. Very, very clear. And uh, you can go back to that other message, and I go through a bunch of scriptures to define this for you. I love it when scripture interprets scripture. I believe that God has placed an anointing upon this church. You want to know what we're supposed to do? We're called to do what God has put in front of us, to run the race that is set before us. Come on, somebody that heard that message. To run the race. Look, it's not like anybody else's race. It's not supposed to be like anybody else's race but we're supposed to run the one that was set in front of us God was always going to speak to you in a very different way than he was going to speak to anybody else as a matter of fact he pulled you away from some things so that you could come where you need to be because he had a word for you he had a plan for you and he moved mountains to get you where you needed to be sister and I could I could just as easily point to everybody else and to myself. God moved mountains to bring me to the place that I am today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Look, I didn't get where I am by myself. <laughs> and every time the enemy sneaks up on you, I want you to remember you didn't get to this place. You didn't get to this blessing. You didn't get to this place in God all by yourself. And if Jesus did it for you before, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the enemy is going to be just as defeated this time as he was back then. God is going to make a way if your feet are planted on the sure foundation. So here's what he said. It, 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 you can read Psalm 91 and you can go, but it specifically says this, that we are going to, because of the power that we receive by dwelling in the secret place, one thing that it says we're going to do, it says angels are going to bear us up and we're not going to dash our foot against a stone. That's talking about authority. But it specifically says that with those feet that aren't being dashed, it says you're going to trample on young lions. 
you're going to trample on young lions. Now, I'm talking to some folks who've been seeking to dwell in the secret place. We spent a whole year <laughs> dwelling in the secret place and had a theme about that. But, uh, but here's what I want you to understand. That, you know, God gave me this message early last year, and, and it just it seemed like, wow, this, it was big, but it just didn't, didn't really stir folks up the way that I thought it would. But you know what? God has a perfect timing, and God lays out pieces of information in just the right order and in just the right timing so that you are ready to receive. And I want to tell you that God is ordering our steps in His Word. Somebody say yeah, hallelujah if you believe it today. He is ordering our steps in his word his word is a lamp unto my feet and it is a light unto my path I need him in order to know where I'm supposed to go I need his word in order to know where my footsteps should be I can't do that on my own and you see many many churches today are bringing in programs and bringing in psychological uh, psychologically educated so-called ministries and they're patting folks on the back and just saying you know you're fine everything's okay you're a good person but I came to tell somebody that number one you're not a good person <laughs> you're not you're just not <laughs> let's just lay it out there Paul said in my flesh there is no good thing there's no good thing. He said, the things that I want to do, I can't even do them because of my stinking stupid. You know, he called it vile flesh. He said, it's vile. This, this thing is just vile. <laughs> but you know what? This vile thing became the temple of the Holy Ghost when I was baptized in the fire, when I was baptized and received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Look, this flesh is still not saved. Still not saved. Your flesh has not been redeemed. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that you cannot enter the kingdom of God except that this corruption has to die and put on incorruption. But one of these days, I'm going to lay this flesh down and I'm, I'm going to have a brand new body and I'm going to see Jesus face to face. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Oh, but we know that when Jesus shall appear, we shall be like Him. For we shall see him as he is. I'm going to have a glorified body just like Jesus. Hallelujah. And you know what? No trial can take that away from me. No discouragement, no battle I'm facing can take my hope away. Because my hope is not in this world. My hope is upon the foundation that Jesus Christ has laid for me. It's a sure foundation. And you're not going to take, somebody already said it in this service, you're not going to take my testimony away from me. I know where I came from. I know how I got to where I am. And it was not without help, but Jesus made a way. He is the sure foundation today. Hallelujah. But I want to continue. Here's what Zechariah is prophesying. Let's move on and see if you recognize any more. But it says there's a voice of the roaring of the young lions, the corrupted pastors, and the false prophets. Jesus said, read, read Matthew 24. Jesus said that in the last days there are going to be many false prophets that rise. For the pride of Jordan is spoiled. Look at verse 4. It says, thus saith the Lord my God, feed the flock of the slaughter. Feed the flock of the slaughter. So church, here's what I've come to tell you. God has revealed instruction to this church. What we're doing in this month is we're talking about the foundations of our faith. In other words, what do we believe and why do we believe it? And what we believe is very, very intimately uh, connected to what God has called us to do. God has put some jewels, some pearls of great price upon this church to carry and to guard and to minister and God has a word that is to go forth. God has given you what he's given you with purpose. And 
It's been a strategical gift that God has given to you, the word that has come forth. Look, foundations of our faith, you might think that we're just going to, you know, read John 3.16 every service and we're just going to, you know, just talk about uh, how to get saved and, and maybe the Holy Ghost because we can't not talk about the Holy Ghost and, you know, we're just going to talk about that over and over again. No, here's what's going to happen. God is going to speak to us about the specific calling that is upon this church and what God has called us to do is to take authority over the conf- fear over the false prophets over those pastors that have corrupted the churches of today I want to tell you in the book of Amos in the 8th chapter the prophecy came forth I preached it last time that there would be a famine just like Jesus said there are going to be famines and it's a sign that I'm getting ready to come back but here's what Amos prophesied it's not a famine of food and it's not a famine of thirst and people want to drink water but it is a famine of hearing the word of God he said this they're going to go from coast to coast and they're going to travel all over trying to hear the word of God and will not receive the preached word of God now let me just tell you something that's happening right now that's been happening for years We've had folks come here. We had a, a, a lady that came. One of them had been to 50 churches. Another one, I, I guess I believe her, she said 75 churches she'd been to. Searching for a church that stands on the Word of God, a, a church that believes the Word of God, that will preach the Word of God without fear or favor. I came to tell you there's a famine going on right now. Let's look further. Get some more specificity from Zechariah. Here's what the next verse says. Verse 5 says, Whose possessors slay them and hold themselves not guilty. And they that sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich. And their own shepherds pity them not. So here's what I'm telling you. I didn't come to call names and to denigrate anybody's ministry. I'm thankful for anybody that's doing anything for God. But here's what the prophet said. He said, there are going to be some pastors that are just trying to get rich off of the people of God. There are going to be some pastors that the preaching the, the unadulterated word of God is going to go out the window. They're going to be hirelings. The Bible said that in the last days, perilous times would come. It said that there would be churches that have a form of God godliness but are denying the power thereof can i tell you today that in this country it's come to the place where only 20% of those in a pew poll recently said that they truly believe that the Word of God is, or that the Bible is the Word of God. 20% believe that the Bible is the true Word of God. As a matter of fact, in the very largest so-called Christian denomination, Catholicism, it was only 15% that said we believe the Bible is the Word of God. So, How many Christians do you think are on the foundation? (laughs) Oh, we just think it's, you know, some good teachings and some nice suggestions and, you know, some fables and some, you know, I'm sorry. I came to tell you that the word of God is forever settled in heaven. (laughs) Oh, it's going to last beyond anybody that tries to tear it down because it is the foundation of Jesus Christ and it is going to last and he is the mighty God, the everlasting father. And the Bible says that his truth endureth to all generations. You can do whatever you want. It's still going to endure. It's still going to endure. I recommend that you get a hold of it for yourself. Let's go back. Just one verse here. I want to show you something that is very specific to some things that we understand. By the way, I haven't taken this book out in a long time, but there are some things that God has spoken to us in this book called the Basilea Code. And this was written five years ago. God gave this book to me and and I wrote this book and it has been out if you do not have a copy it talks about the kingdom of God it 
talks about some of these revelations and things to come. And it is founded upon Scripture. It is founded firmly upon the, the, the sure foundation of the Word of God. And so some of the things that I'm talking about are detailed in the book. But here's what I want to draw your attention to. Our calling, according to Zechariah, in this last day is, Thus saith the Lord, God, feed the flock of the slaughter. Feed the flock of the slaughter. Now, what could that be talking about? Well, we're uh, aware of some things that God showed us in Isaiah, the 30th chapter and the 25th verse. Here's the way that it prophesies the very last generation. It's going to be characterized as having the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. The day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. Now, in 2001, we experienced the day of the great slaughter when the towers fell. There's nothing in all of history that fits the description in that chapter. But here's what I want to show you just for today. I'm not going to go any further into that. I want to show you what the Spirit of God is speaking to us. Because if we are to feed the flock of the slaughter, could it be that this prophecy is talking about this generation today? We are halfway through, 22 years almost through that generation that began on 9-11 of 2001. Think about that. If that is the mark of the last generation, we're halfway through it. And that means Jesus is coming back. And we have a work to do before he comes. We've got something to say to somebody before time is at an end. I don't know about you, but I want to do what God has called me to do while it is day. I'm going to work while it is day because the night is coming the night is coming and I've been called to preach a word to somebody. I've been called to preach to the generation, to the flock of the slaughter. The flock of the slaughter. People who are being led astray. Jesus called it the blind leading the blind. He said they're both going to go off in the ditch. That's what he called those pastors and, and the false prophets that have risen up. But uh, so let's, let's move on to the seventh verse here. Here's what the word of God says. I will feed the flock of the slaughter, even you, O poor of the flock. And I took unto me two staves. That means a staff, two staves. The one I called beauty. And the other I called bands, and I fed the flock. The one was called beauty, and the other was called bands. Let's take a look at Isaiah, the 61st chapter, and verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. There are the bands. That's the bands right there. I fed the flock of the slaughter because I had a staff that was called bands. I'm going to bind up the brokenhearted. And let's go on in this verse a little bit further. I'm going to preach good tidings unto the meek. He sent me to the blind uh, to bind up the broken hearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and opening of the prison to them that are bound. And then the third verse puts it this way, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, those that are grieving, those that are depressed, those that are, have laid down their joy. I've got a word for them today right on in the church to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, all oh, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he he might be glorified. So let's get this straight, Zechariah. You're prophesying that there would be somebody that is ministering in the last day to the flock of the slaughter who's been oppressed, who's been abused, who's been led astray off of the foundation. There's going to be somebody with an anointing of a staff that's called band and a staff that's called beauty. They're going to have authority. They're going to have
have an anointing uh, to bind up uh, the brokenhearted, uh, to bind up uh, those that have been abused, uh, to bind up uh, the wounds uh, that the enemy has tried to use uh, to destroy the very flock uh, of the people of God. And then there's going to be uh, a restoration uh, beauty uh, in spite of the ashes. Uh, there's going to be the oil uh, of joy for mourning and the garment uh, of praise for the spirit of heaviness and that's the anointing of the church that is called to minister to the, the flock of the slaughter two staves with this one I'm going to bind up the broken hearted because God has anointed me to do it and I have the authority to do it with the other staff. I don't care if flames have decimated every hope and every plan and everything that God has promised you went up in flames and you don't see any way that it can happen. I want to tell you he's about to restore every plan. He said I'm not finished with you. He said I know the plans that I have for you and I I'm going to watch over my word to perform it. I'm going to give you beauty for ashes. There's about to be a resurrection of hope in your life. There's about to be a resurrection of joy. The oil of joy for mourning. Hallelujah. Oh, somebody's coming. Somebody's coming. Somebody's coming that laid their praise aside. Somebody's coming because they didn't fit any longer and they had to conform to some other church that was being led astray, that didn't know how to worship God, that didn't know how to seek after the presence of the Lord. They're coming. They're coming. And we're going to show them how to have the, the garment of praise, to put on the garment of praise. Put it on. Put it on. Here it is. It belongs to you. Look, a church that doesn't know how to praise is never going to teach anybody else how to praise. Come on. A church that doesn't chase after the presence of God and seek after the Holy Ghost is never going to be able to show someone else how to walk in the presence of an almighty God. And in His presence is where the fullness of joy resides. It's in His presence that there are miracles for you. It's in His presence He'll speak and miracles will happen. It's in his presence. It's in his presence. Hallelujah. Church, God has laid a mantle upon you to preach to this generation, the church, who is the flock of the slaughter. Hallelujah. Let's go to Jeremiah. I'm going to try and wrap this up today. Let's go to Jeremiah, the second chapter. God, I'm out of breath. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank God for breath. <laughs> Jeremiah, the second chapter. I want you to see something here. Here's what was prophesied by Jeremiah. He said, the priests said not, where is the Lord? They didn't say, where is God? Let's, let's do whatever we can do to follow after his presence. He's, it says, and they that handle the law knew me not. Look at this. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal. And walked after things that do not profit. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. Let's take a look at verse 13, if you can take me to verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. I want you to pay attention to this. Here's what he said. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. If there was ever a description of what is happening, did you know that less than 30% of folks calling themselves Pentecostal have ever received the Holy Ghost and spoken in tongues? You can walk into a Pentecostal church, they can have the, the, the name however they want it, 
But you can walk into a Pentecostal church and you wonder if anybody's ever had the Holy Ghost because people have set aside searching and seeking after the Spirit of God. The ministers have departed from saying, Lord, where are you? What's going on? Why are we in a famine of the Word of God? Why are we in a famine of the move of the presence of God? And you can have, uh, you, if, you, if you get some honest folks that are dotted in that congregation, I've spoken to them some of you have spoken to them. I've got family that is in churches exactly like that. And what they'll say in honest moments is, I don't know what happened. We used to worship God. The Holy Ghost used to move. But it's been many years since anybody's even been baptized in the Holy Ghost or healed or delivered or anything of the sort. We just come together and we just, we just sort of sit there and just go through the time. For my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And the other evil is that they've hewed them out cisterns and broken cisterns that can hold no water. A cistern is a well that contains water and is meant to be something that will sustain. But I want to take you to a scripture in the book of John, the seventh chapter and the 38th verse, just in case you're confused about this. Come on, church. It's clear as a bell, but I'm going to make it clearer today. Here's what John said in the seventh chapter. He said this, he that believeth on me, Jesus spoke. He said, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And you know what? He went on to clarify. He said, this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive because the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. If you're wondering what the prophet was seeing way down the road, here's what he had to, to tell us. He said they're going to be shepherds that don't seek after the presence of God, that don't seek after the river of living water anymore. It was never supposed to be about you building your own well. It was always supposed to be about rivers of living living water through the power of the Holy Ghost that we're going to flow from your innermost being. You can't get it with a program. You can't get it by some formula. you got to get baptized in the Holy Ghost and you're going to have rivers that will not be stopped. But the prophet said the problem lies herein. There are some evils at work here. Now, look, I'm not being nice today. Some, some days I'm nice to everybody that is not seeking God. Some days I'm just, you know, thankful for anybody that's, you know, getting saved anywhere. I'm not being nice today because the prophet has laid a mantle upon this church to preach the truth. Either it's the truth or it's not. You can't have it both ways. Either the Holy Ghost is the power. Either that river of living water is supposed to be present or it's not. You can't have it both ways. You better make up your mind. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to stand on the sure foundation of the Word of God and we're going to seek after the presence of God. No matter what the cost. No matter what the cost. Look, I've had people look at me sideways. I've had people call me anything but a child of God for the things that I believe. But can I tell you that God is who He is and His promises are yea and amen. And His word means what it says and says what it means. And you better line up with Him and get your feet planted on the sure foundation or you're going to be knocked down sure as the world. Hallelujah. Rivers of living water. And the evil was that they, they stopped seeking after the rivers of living water. And they created cisterns that kept stagnant water for a while. Come on, let's follow the logic here. The other evil is they, they were never called to create cisterns. It's the river of living water that's going to quench. Jesus said, you'll never thirst again. You'll never thirst again. You'll never thirst again if you drink of this water. Rivers of living water. They were never supposed to build a cistern 
to captivate water and shape it and mold it and, and have it just in this place and not over here. Come on, somebody. They were never supposed. Look, you can't control rivers of living water. You cannot stop rivers of living water. They're going to flow and they're going to flow and they're going to flow and they're going to captivate everybody around. They're going to flood the area and it's not going to be dry anywhere around when there's a river of living water. But here we're going to build cisterns, and we're just going to keep just a little bit of that, just a little bit of it. But you know what? The prophet said it doesn't stop there, but that cistern was cracked and couldn't even hold that much water. Church, this is what we're seeing. This is what we're seeing. Some of you came out of churches like that to be where you are right now. Am I telling the truth? So church, I, I'm not trying, honestly, I'm not trying to preach about everybody else. I really am not. I am trying to preach about us. I'm trying to preach about the mantle that God has placed on us. I'm trying to preach about the foundations of our faith and what God has given to us and entrusted to us. So let's go on in Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the second chapter. And the 19th verse. We're going to just read a couple more verses. Brother Nate, would you come? Here's what he went on to say about these ministers, these pastors. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. What is this describing? It's describing the tribulation because folks are not going to be ready when Jesus comes. And here's what he said. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God. And look at this. And that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. This is precisely what's happening. Folks are putting aside the fear of the Lord, putting aside, well, maybe, maybe the Old Testament really doesn't matter. Maybe this scripture doesn't really matter. Maybe we can just hold on to God is love. <laughs> and all the rest of it, we can just find fault with. No, I want to tell you something. You, you better stand on his foundation because his foundation is sure. The rest of it is sinking sand. Hallelujah. Come on. That cistern that you've tried to manufacture and let God move when you want him to move and how he, uh, you want him to manifest and, and nothing else. We're not going to abide by the things that we were taught. We're going to lay all those things aside and make everybody comfortable. The cistern is about making people comfortable in the church. The cistern is about taking the Spirit of God off the platform and putting it into a back room. The cistern is about saying we're going to control the Spirit of God. We're going to control the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. We're still going to call ourselves Pentecostal, but we're going to make sure that it's hidden and, and it looks nice and, and it's put in its proper place, and we're still going to call ourselves Pentecostal, but more than 51% of our pastors don't even have the Holy Ghost anymore, even though they're pastoring so-called Pentecostal churches. Why? Because that very cistern that they had a little bit of water in it's dried up because it went out the cracks. That's what the prophet said. That's what the prophet said. But folks, let me tell you something. They're, they're, they're going to be fish coming into the net. And they're going to need the two staffs. They're going to need the binding up. And they're going to need the restoration of beauty for ashes. And they're going to need the authority that God has laid upon us. Hallelujah. The problem is that they fear not God. I want to take you just to one more verse in Malachi, the third chapter, the 16th verse. Sometime I'll preach more on this. I've preached a lot about the fear of God. It's missing in much of the church world today. As a matter of fact, if you talk about it, you just might be ridiculed. I've heard folks say that your, your, your problem is that you're afraid of God. Yes, yes, I am afraid of God. I am afraid of God. But there's a godly fear that is spoken of. And here's what Malachi had to say prophetically about it. It said, then they that feared the Lord spake 
spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. I don't know about you, but I, I'll give anything. I'll give anything to make it when Jesus comes. I'll do anything to hear the trumpet and to be caught up to meet him in the air. I'll give anything away. I'll do anything. Do you hear what I'm saying? I'll preach the word of God. I'll pray. I'll fast. I'll watch. I'll do anything that is required of me. I cannot miss what's coming next. The trumpet is about to sound. And the word of God said this. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Oh, but then we, which are alive and remain, are going to be caught up to meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I'm not concerned about the corrections that are going to take place during the tribulation because God is going to spare the ones that fear Him. Let's stand together, church. I believe we've received instruction. We're not just anybody. We are a church that is seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We're a church that believes the Word of God. After I preached that message about Amos and what he had to say entitled A Love for the Truth, the very next week I went to the church mailbox, the very next Sunday, and somebody had very generously sent their book that they wrote to me. It's not unusual, except that this book tries to explain away all of the end time prophecy as having already taken place. You can't make this stuff up. You can't make it up. <laughs> so I'm sure this gentleman was well intentioned, but God, you got my attention. You got my attention. We've been called to preach truth. We've been called to pay the price because you can't have truth without paying a price. Buy the truth and sell it not. Let me just close with this. Paul said this. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. I'm not ashamed. Hallelujah. I'll preach the cross of Calvary till my last breath is, is gone or Jesus takes me in the rapture. I'm going to preach about Jesus and Him crucified. I don't care what the world thinks about it. I don't care how many folks decide that I'm going to be on their popularity list or not. I've made a choice. I've decided to stand upon the foundation that's named Jesus Christ. He is the head. He is the cornerstone, and he's going to take me all the way to glory. I'm going to see him face to face. I'm going to finish this race. It's right around the corner, church. It's just around the bend. Hallelujah. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. This is the moment that God is moving in your life like never before. Don't you dare give up. There's restoration that's about to overtake your life. There are miracles right around the corner for you. Come on. I said that there's going to be joy in the morning time. All the weeping has gone on all night long. Oh, the joy is going to come. Joy is about to come in the morning time. Stay on the foundation. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody you praise Him. You will never, you will never, you'll never thirst.